Welcome to the chaos sector. Now that we have established the motive behind Michael Myers, let's scan through all films in the original timeline, excluding the first film. We do this to put everything into perspective of the Halloween franchise. In the 1981 sequel, Myers is once again tracking down Laurie Strode in the hospital. But this time, the storyline reveals that Laurie Strode is Myers' younger sister. As Laurie sleeps in her room, she has a vision of visiting Michael in Smith's Grove Sanitarium when they were kids. Also, what she assumed to be her biological mother, tells Laurie that she is not her mother. In somewhat of a clairvoyance moment, Laurie realizes that Myers may be her brother. Myers finally arrives at the hospital, stalking Laurie once more. He kills everyone in the hospital, except for Jimmy, who survived. Dr. Loomis saves her by blowing both himself and Myers up in the explosion. What is considered to be non-related to Myers, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, was the next film. Although it was not as popular as its predecessors, the film was greatly underrated. The plot of the film is based on Mr. Cochran, a madman who's planning a Halloween mass murder utilizing an ancient Celtic ritual. The ritual involves a boulder stolen from Stonehenge, the use of silver shamrock masks and a triggering device contained in a television commercial. All designed to kill millions of children nationwide. But there are some treats in this film that were quite interesting. Dr. Chalice's wife, Linda Chalice, is Annie from the original film. She even carried the same snarky attitude into this film. The woman announcing the curfew for the town in Santa Mira is none other than Jamie Lee Curtis. One of the androids designed by Cochran, who Dr. Chalice fought at the end, played Myers in the previous film. And, the biggest treat, was the guest appearance of Myers himself in a television commercial of the Halloween film. This was very creative, technically breaking the fourth wall within the film. The androids were similar to Myers, basically the same without the mask. In my opinion, the film's purpose was to introduce the origins of the Halloween season itself, explaining the history of that holiday. Then, Myers returns, in Halloween 4, Return of Michael Myers. Dr. Loomis also returns, with facial scars from the explosion in Halloween 2. In this film's storyline, Laurie Strode has been killed in a car accident, and Jamie Lloyd, her daughter, is now the focus of the plot. Myers hunts down his niece, accompanied by her foster sister in Rachel. They survive the attack, as Myers is shot multiple times by Hanfield police, and falls into a mine shaft. In the end, Jamie kills her foster mother, as Dr. Loomis reacts hysterically. In Halloween 5, Revenge of Michael Myers, the plot continues with Myers surviving multiple shots and narrowly avoiding the explosion. Jamie Lloyd is now hospitalized, but is mute and telepathically connected to Myers, which indicated when and where he was in the setting. The reason for this is she touched Myers's hand in the previous film, and of course, the Curse of Thorn, which hadn't been established yet, was partially passed on to Jamie. She became possessed and kills her foster mother at the end of the film. Myers kills Rachel, her friends, then finally reaches Jamie. He is stopped, then arrested. A barrage of gunfire rings out at the police station, and Myers is broken out of jail. And finally, in Halloween, Curse of Michael Myers, the storyline reaches the end, explaining the plot to the audience. Myers returns after being broken out of jail, to hunt down his niece Jamie once again. Jamie calls a radio show, hoping Dr. Loomis would hear the message. And, Loomis did hear her pleas. Jamie tries to escape in a pickup truck, as Myers chases in a van. But unfortunately, Jamie was killed, yet she did save her baby before her demise. She cunningly lured Myers away, as he assumed she had her baby with her in the pickup. The Strode family, which adopted Lori, was also targeted due to not only living in Myers' house, but also due to being linked to Lori. Kara Strode and her son Danny were the focus of the family setting. I have this funny feeling that Danny was the son of Myers. I know, there is no real evidence to support this theory, but hear me out. There is a scene where Danny is having a nightmare, Dr. Wynn appears, and tells Danny, kill for him. Wynn is referring to someone other than himself, because he didn't say kill for, me? Right? Who is the other individual Wynn wants Danny to kill for? Well, the only other evil character is Myers. Later at breakfast, Kara gets into an altercation with her father, John Strode. John tells Kara that going to college doesn't make up for her mistakes, and the family was doing fine until she and her quote, bastard son of hers, showed up. A bastard child of course, is one that doesn't know their father. You could say it's just how the script was written, not having a father character associated with Kara or her son. But since we are dealing with a cult, their ritual practices, and how Danny just gives off subtle characteristics of being Myers' offspring, I think this is logical at least. Kara stands up to him, and he slaps her. Danny grabs a knife, and threatens to stab his grandfather. This scene alludes to, Danny becoming the next killer. It's not only that, but Kara finds drawings that Danny had, with the thorn symbol on it. 
So Danny was starting to fall victim to Wynn's influence, maybe it was instinctive anyway, based on being Myers's offspring. I'm getting downloads, it's all coming full circle. Hear me out, it's a theory, but I'm gonna go for it. Ready? Kara had been kidnapped by the cult at some point, then drugged. Myers impregnates her, then she is sent back into society, without any knowledge of what happened. She soon gives birth to Myers's son, Danny. They both return home, and this is when their story begins in the film. Remember, the cult consists of doctors and nurses, and one of their practices was to in fact, kidnap and drug their victims. At the end of Halloween 5, Myers was broken out of jail, and Jamie was, kidnapped. In the producer's cut, Myers impregnates his niece, then commanded to kill Jamie, and that baby. In the director's cut, there is no storyline of Myers impregnating Jamie, he merely is determined to carry out his ritual killings of his bloodline. The point is, obviously there are wicked practices of the cult, including ritual family killings, sacrifices, and even incest. Even later in the film, Dr. Loomis, Tommy, and Kara were drugged after being captured. In the producer's cut, Kara is placed on the table to be offered as a sacrifice, with Wynne, Danny, and Myers around the table. Kara tells Myers, which was depicted as her intuition, that he knows that the baby is his, and he can stop the cult. Myers showed a bit of hesitance, as he looks over to Kara, as if he was being convinced. And this may be due to his connection to her, who was the mother of his child, Danny. This Strode family was vital to the storyline. Lori was adopted by the Strodes, so obviously the cult and Myers had a vested interest in those family members. Use Kara to give birth to the next assassin, as Myers will eventually fade off after completing his ritual tasks. Wynne even tells Loomis that it would be the dawn of a new age, indicating that the cult had gained new blood, new energy, and new evil to work through. And that would be Danny. Wow, that's a lot, hey? This plot would be very intriguing, as Kara would have been very important in a potential storyline that would develop from this. And Danny would have become the next assassin in the Halloween franchise. As Jamie's baby gradually becomes more important in that storyline. Can't confirm it was a fact of course, just felt the need to point out the possibility. There is also another potential wacky plot twist that I want to touch on. Hear me out, Jamie is actually, drumroll, Meyer's daughter. Wow, that's insane, right? If Myers impregnates his niece in the producer's cut, then is it irrational that Myers also impregnated his sister in the past? Let's break it down. Jamie Lloyd's parents are, Lori and, well, Mr. Lloyd. In the biography, Jamie's alleged father was married to Lori Strode, right? They even have a photo of Jamie with her father. But, it's odd that the father of Jamie doesn't have a first name listed in his biography. Since there is a photo, and Lori and Mr. Lloyd were married, it kinda contradicts my theory. In Halloween 4, Myers is scrummaging through photos, and comes across a photo of Jamie and her father. But there is no identity, despite the photo, of this alleged father. The bio has Lori married to this man, so if they were married, there has to be a legal first name given to the character, you know, for the sake of creating a realistic story to the audience. Such as John Doe meets Jane, and they have children, named Jason and Jessica Doe. But in this case, Mr. Lloyd doesn't have a first name listed. Everyone else, in the family tree has a first name. In the first two films, the Myers family have first names, Donald Myers, Edith Myers, Judith Myers, and Michael Myers. In connection, are the initial family members of the Strodes. Morgan Strode, Pamela Strode, and of course Laurie Strode. Then in the Jamie Lloyd storyline, you have the Carruthers family. Richard Carruthers, Darlene Carruthers, and Rachel Carruthers, and of course Jamie Lloyd. And finally, in the finale storyline, the other Strodes all have first names. John Strode, Deborah Strode, Kara Strode, Tim Strode, and Danny Strode. They even have Jamie's baby listed as Stephen Lloyd, although he was never given this name by his mother. Although those characters were physically in the films, it's more about the biography of each character's life. Why didn't they just give Mr. Lloyd a first name of, James? James and Lori have a daughter, which they name, Jamie. Jamie is a combination of James and Lori. This is a simple addition to the biography of Jamie's father, right? You don't have to dig deep into his backstory, it's merely to provide your main characters with relatives. But if they do not have first names, how can we truly believe they exist? With a cast, you have some characters listed as, janitor, or security guard number one, security guard number two, doctor, paramedic, teacher, etc. Mr. Lloyd is not one of those characters, he is the father of the main character in Halloween 4. So he should have a first name, right? Of course. They went out of their way to establish that Mr. Lloyd met Lori Strode, got married, and had a daughter. With this detailed backstory, why is a first name missing from the father of Lori's daughter? Also, in Halloween 4, Jamie is crying, looking at a photo of her mother Lori. 
But why isn't there a photo of Lori and her husband, Mr. Lloyd, together, to show mother and father in that sad moment for Jamie? Apparently, his identity can't truly be acknowledged. And on top of that, Lori is not listed as taking the last name of Lloyd, so, she is still unmarried by definition. Unless she didn't take the last name, because she found out who Mr. Lloyd was, once the mask was put back on, during their honeymoon, and then was killed off-screen. And one more, how can Jamie take on the last name of Mr. Lloyd, if her mother didn't? Since Lori is still listed as Lori Strode, this means she did not take the last name of Mr. Lloyd, which legally speaking, she is not actually married to Mr. Lloyd by law. Which also means, her daughter is Jamie Strode. These oddities seem intentional, but I think it was meant to be discovered, eventually. Huh. This mysterious aspect of Mr. Lloyd opens up the possibility that Myers perhaps is Jamie's biological father. Remember, Myers did impregnate his niece in the producer's cut. So, it is also possible, with this ritual practice of incest, that Myers impregnated his sister to produce that daughter-slash-niece. Now we can assume that the actual photo used for Mr. Lloyd is literally Danielle Harris's real father. But it still requires an actual first name in the fictional storyline of the character, right? In this biography, they have Mr. Lloyd meeting Laurie Strode after 1978, and in 1980, they gave birth to none other than Jamie Lloyd. Now although both films occur on the same night in the year 1978, who exactly is this man? Keep in mind, this occurs soon after the sequel. Is it Jimmy from the 1981 sequel? Well, based on the H2O timeline, Jimmy was killed soon after the events of 1978. Jimmy was present for Lori's graduation on May 25, 1979. He tried to attract Lori's attention but she ignored him, immediately regretting it afterward. Michael Myers reappeared that evening and attempted to kill Lori again before driving to Jimmy's house. Lori barely arrived in time to see Michael snap his neck and smash his body through a glass table, leaving her to cry over his broken and mangled corpse. Although it's the H2O retcon storyline, Jimmy is dead. Is it, perhaps, Ziggy? The point, if it were one of those characters, the storyline would acknowledge them as Jamie's father. So we can scratch out Jimmy and Ziggy, and there is the problem. Myers was set on fire at the end of the 1981 sequel. But, the storyline is in the year 1978. In two years, Myers most definitely would have recovered to impregnate his sister and she gave birth to Jamie in the year 1980. In the storyline, it is assumed that Myers was recovering for approximately 10 years when Halloween 4 comes out in the year 1988. But honestly, do you believe Myers was recovering for the entire 10-year hiatus? I don't think so. Of course this all occurs off-screen and to be kept secret within the storyline. Interesting enough, in Halloween Resurrection, Lori kisses Myers on the lips. Now, this would be her brother, and is a serial killer, right? If we take the mask off of Myers, Lori would have kissed her brother on the lips, right? Stay with me here, because something is leaking out. Why would Lori kiss her brother on the lips? She didn't kiss him on the cheek, as a sign of affection and love for one sibling. No, she kisses him on the lips, which is a sign of attraction, or even dare say, lust. This is not some Italian family tradition behavior, so we can only assume it's sexual. And if it's sexual, then my theory is logical. Also, Lori tells Myers, I'll see you in hell. Why would Lori assume she is going to hell, with her brother? She was essentially a good person in the storyline, she hadn't stabbed anyone like Jamie Lloyd, right? Unless, she had committed a great sin, of sexual relations with her brother. Which would be the same incest that was practiced in the producer's cut of the final film. Resurrection is the sequel to H2O, which is 20 years later, after 1978. If so-called Mr. Lloyd meets Lori Strode in 1978 and has a child in Jamie two years later, Resurrection storyline would be linked to the events of 1978, right? Now of course, there is no Jamie in that retcon timeline, but, Lori kissing Myers appears to be a subliminal message to being impregnated by Myers in the quote, off-screen timeline. It seems like a reach, but Mr. Lloyd has no first name, and without a first name, he could be anybody. His identity is a mystery, and when there's mystery, there's secrecy, and when there's secrecy, there's a conspiracy. And that conspiracy would be to keep the identity of Jamie's father a secret by not providing a first name. Which of course makes him a mysterious character. Just like the mystery of Myers' identity being kept secret with his mask. There were a few moments, but the identity itself was not truly perceived as a character, you understand? It all makes sense, because obviously there is a twisted family ritual practice of the Celtic cult, carrying on the bloodline of Myers through incest. Now the photo is what keeps ruining my theory, but without a first name to that man in the photo, that could very well be Michael Myers without his mask. Let's give this a review. Halloween 4 introduces Mr. Lloyd as Jamie's father, with no first name. The photo could be Myers without a mask. 
Halloween 5 even shows Myers shedding a tear, maybe this is a father-daughter moment, which we thought was a uncle-niece moment? And the producer's cut of the final film has Myers impregnate alleged niece before killing her. In all of this, it is logical to suggest that Myers impregnated his sister, giving birth to a daughter in Janie. Laurie Strode is then killed, depicted as a car accident with quote, Mr. Lloyd. Then, in the cult's twisted practices, Myers impregnates his own daughter in Janie. The cult then command Myers kill that daughter for committing such a sin. In the producer's cut, Jamie pleads with Wynne and the cult to give her back her baby. Interesting enough though, she pleads with Myers, saying quote, Michael, forgive me. Why would Jamie ask for forgiveness from her deranged uncle? He should be the one asking for forgiveness, right? That's asking a lot, to be honest, but even still. Unless, she is asking for forgiveness from a cult that practices such twisted judgments, based on ancient belief systems, right? Jamie would feel guilty for giving birth to her uncle's child, which the cult provoked this emotion into her. Out of fear and just the fact that she did give birth to her uncle's child, Jamie feels guilty and asks her uncle to forgive her. Or, even possibly, her father. The cult uses Myers as a vessel for such wicked practices, then acts as this twisted and demented judgment upon sinners which they provoked. They order their assassin to kill those so-called sinners, to somewhat atone for their own wicked practices as well. Yep, that's about right. What do you think? Perhaps I dove too deep into the plot, but I think there is something there. Excluding that, and a few more plot twists in the producer's cut, the storyline most definitely had potential to continue. Danny, and Jamie's baby, Stephen, could have provided years of exciting Halloween films, if done properly in connection to the original timeline. Tommy Doyle, Kara and Danny Strode, and Jamie's baby, all survived in the storyline. Even Dr. Wynne is not depicted as dying, nor is the majority of the Celtic cult. And obviously, Myers is still lurking in the shadows. Maybe he would become the next win, or even the next, I dare say, Loomis? The curse of Thorn had been lifted, he was no longer afflicted. It would provide a great ending to his legacy, finally overcoming the evil, and challenging the new evil in Danny. Now that would be fucking badass in my opinion. Dr. Loomis was the only main character who didn't, due to Donald Pleasance passing away. Overall, the film was intense, and had a decent finale which ended somewhat prematurely, due to related complexities of the franchise. You know, this has been quite the review, I'm exhausted. We will return, examining the original film and the sibling connection that exists within it. This is the Chaos Sector, Film Reviews.